Hi everyone, I'm really excited to interview Chris Mackey. He's co-founder of the tool Ladybug. I have personally used this tool in my graduate studio and it helped me a lot in, in my concept de development phase. So I'm really excited for this interview. Without much ado, let's jump into the interview. So, hi Chris, can you take our audience through where you grew up, what you did, economics of your household, and out of all things you could have done, why you chose architecture? All right, sure. Thanks, Mayur. So sure, just to give you a sense of my background, I grew up in New York, just right outside of New York City, through, I guess, a middle-class family home. And I guess I, if talking about sort of how this influenced how I came into architecture, to be honest, I, when I was a kid, I always thought that I was going to be a scientist. And from the age of five, I thought I was going to be a scientist. And, and that was true really all through up, up through high school. But I think when I got to college, I started realizing that the, maybe it was more the type of science that I liked was one that dealt with these very types of complex systems, like what you'd find in earth science or astronomy or buildings for that matter. And so in my first semester at college, I took a, a course that was, I didn't realize at the time, but it was the first environmental design course that, that my school had offered. And, and I just, I fell in love with it. And yeah, and from that day forward, yeah, I was hardcore into architecture and, and building science. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what were one or two incidents that had a huge impact in shaping your philosophy? Well, I think, yeah, we actually already uh, got one in there. That that first class I took, uh, and by the way, I should give a shout out, the professor was Michelle Addington. But yeah, that course definitely had a huge impact in shaping where where I, I went from there. I mean, yeah, there were a lot of other really good experiences, but in terms of ones that really directed where I, where I ended up going, uh, that one was really critical. I mean, I think both because it, it showed me, it introduced me to the world of architecture as the first architecture course I had taken. And two, because it really, it showed me how well it blended all the sciences that I was interested in. <laughs> so. uh, and any interesting memories from your studios? Yeah, yeah, there were, let's see. There were uh, a number of great, great triumphs in the studio. I mean, I, I remember, yeah, I certainly remember lots of late nights staying up very late. And, and I guess I remember the first time that I really managed to produce like a cohesive, like building design. And after the review of that, that was, that was a wonderful moment. It, yeah, it definitely made me fall in love with the process of design and just the, this, I mean, I guess the, the kind of tension that you have in the process of design where you become really invested in something but yet you still also need to take a step back and be critical of it at a certain point in time. And just the, yeah, I love I, that tension. It's, it's a skill that you develop while, you know, while being in the, in design courses and, and just engaging with design. But I think, yeah, that was just the realization that that was kind of how design worked. It was a really a great moment. And I learned that through my studios. Mm -hmm. And I think you partly answered this question, like because of your interest, of your environmental science course, but I still want to ask, like you earned dual masters in architecture and building technology. So what made you pursue that path and what were the key lessons learned? Yeah, so I, I should say first, my undergraduate was was 100% architecture, BR degree. But for grad school at MIT, I did, a, I did both a master's of architecture and the master's of science and building technology. And I think, I mean, Part of that was, uh, admittedly, I picked up the building science degree halfway through my time at, at MIT, but I knew going into MIT that I really wanted to have some sort of degree that engaged with the sciences. I mean, especially, yeah, after I graduated from college uh, and, and realizing that, I guess, that not all of the architecture discipline was quite like that environmental design course that I took and that, you know, that it'd be really helpful for me to bring, I think, the knowledge from these other sciences and and mix those into the the architecture background that I had so I knew I knew basically going into MIT that I wanted to do the dual degree and and essentially yeah I mean thankfully MIT in particular I have to give a shout out is was very open to people you know crossing over disciplines and doing ty these types of dual degrees and so I was able to to take that on I think much more easily than I probably could in in, in other places and I yeah and I 
definitely am very thankful to MIT for that. And I, and I learned a lot as a result of it. I did, I mean, the thesis that I did was a combined thesis between those two degrees. And I think because it had both sides of uh, the equation, it was a, yeah, it was, it was a better thesis than it could have been, I think, if, if I was only able to bring one of those topics to bear on it. Mm-hmm. And what was the most challenging part during those years? The most challenging part, well, yeah, it's hard to say what the most challenging is, but I can definitely say, yeah, if I could share like something that I know is definitely challenging, but I feel like a lot of people don't talk about it as much as that. I, I learned all of my software development background, I learned in uh, grad school and afterwards, and it was not actually even through a any uh, specific course that I took in it. It was all basically on my own time trying to trying to just apply software and, you know, and trying to pick it up over, over, you know, in my free time and over summers. Uh, But like, I think what a lot of people don't talk about, a lot of software developers in particular don't talk about is that uh, like learning to code, (laughs) it's, it's a traumatic experience. I mean, there's a lot of like, you know, especially as you're trying to apply it, maybe if I'm to draw an analogy and maybe this is not actually that far from the analogy, it's a bit like uh, trying to fight a really tough video game boss where you know you try and you try and you try and you try to figure out this problem in your code and you just can't you know put it together and you get you can get very frustrated and there's like a trauma associated with that but i think what happens is that all of us people who make it through and become software developers we only remember that last part where we you know we put down the controller we came back next day and then we beat them on the first go <laughs> like you know you just remember that triumph of implementing you know the, the software and so we don't talk about how difficult and challenging it was to really to learn it in the first place so but I can I can assure you that like if you those of you who are learning to code who may be listening to this like if you the most important thing is just to keep sticking with it uh, and to not give up and it's and it can be tough when you know when when you're frustrated by a certain problem that you're trying to solve with it but if you pull through you know you'll you'll you can, you'll be a software developer <laughs> You know, you'll get there as long as you keep trying. Mm-hmm. And like, it's quite interesting that you shared that uh, it was, it came out as a self-driven and passion project on your weekends and free time. And did you had like a community to support you when like things were not going right? Or? Yes. Yeah. That's well, yeah, they're very important things. And if maybe I'm like kind of jumping ahead here and already giving some advice, but if, if anyone is learning how to code and listening to this, I would really recommend, like you really need three things to learn how to code. You need some sort of reference, like, you know, whether it's like I binged watched like a two, 48 hour video series for my reference, or some people like books and stuff. You need one of those. You need projects though to apply it to. If you're not applying that knowledge, it'll it'll slip through your fingers very fast. So you really need to be applying it. But invariably, when you're applying it, you're going to get stuck uh, and you're not going to know what to do. So it's very important that you also have a community, as you said, the, the last part, to be able to ask your questions to. And thankfully, I mean, probably more so than a lot of other disciplines, there's like software development has really made use of the Internet to disseminate knowledge. So there are great communities. I mean, things like Stack Overflow and like, you know, all these places that are just powerhouses for answering questions. And we try to adopt that philosophy too with Ladybug Tools that we have a forum where, you know, we direct everybody to ask their questions and we all share knowledge on there uh, so that, you know, if someone gets stuck, they can search and probably even just the Google search will return something from our forums and people can continue that way. Uh, So yeah, so having a community is very important, but particularly for software development, you have, your community can be literally the earth (laughs) thanks to the technology of the internet and and through uh, platforms like Stack Overflow and and Google and and all the other things that you can use at your disposal to search for questions when you get stuck. Mm -hmm. And how does a typical day in your life look like? So well, these days, <laughs> I've, I'm not going out that much, I guess, as you can imagine. I, I imagine all of us are probably not getting out as much given the, uh, the current global pandemic. But, but yeah, I, I mean, I do a lot of software development, I mean, these days, because I'm, I'm full-time working on, on Ladybug tools. And especially the last year and a half, we've just been totally revising the software from the ground up for the, the next re- like release that's a full new revision of the software which we're probably only a f- like a few weeks away from right now from at least putting that on food for rhino I, I sh- all of our software is on github if you know 
it's all it's all out in the open. But yeah, we're close to having something really official to package everyone. So many of my days have been just yeah, de- developing code, answering questions on our forum, and you know making some development plans for the time going forward. And I guess and walking my dog. <laughs> So that, that kind of sums up a pretty typical day for me these days, at least during the pandemic. Good luck with your launch. Can you share us uh, the story how you met Mustafa and started Ladybug? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it was, if it was back in 2013, it was like seven years ago, or maybe a little over seven years ago now that I, I met Mustafa actually quite around this time of year. But I remember like up until the point where I met Mustafa, I was really, I was using a lot of different types of tools to, to try and model buildings and, and educate myself about modeling buildings. But I'd always, I was constantly finding myself like hitting a wall uh, of, you know, not being able to do, test a certain like, you know, cool, innovative strategy that I came up with that I wanted to see if it actually work, you know, but, and I kept hitting these walls a lot of the times because, you know, these the tools I've been working with, a lot of the, most of them were proprietary. And so at a certain point, right, you hit the source code, you can't edit it. And then I watched the video that Mustafa put up of just him using Ladybug tools, which he had just released like six months earlier. And I saw all the things that he was doing, all the like freedom and flexibility and like, you know, that everything was out in the open down to the source code. And I just thought like, this is definitely what I want to be using, you know, for the rest, (laughs) for the foreseeable like future of my career. And Amazingly, like, you know, a few days after I watched Mustafa's video, I heard that he was going to be moving over to Thornton Tomasetti, where I had a summer internship at that time. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is, this is great. And, uh, you know, and when he finally got there, I, yeah, I, we, we met, we had many, many a conversation. And, and even though that was only like, yeah, just one summer internship I had here, one, I, honestly, actually, it was probably only those are the only like two or three months that like Mustafa and I lived in the same city, but like, yeah, that's, that's all that was needed. And yeah. And from that, there, that point on, we, you know, I, I started contributing to Ladybug and, you know, within a year or two, I, you know, was close to close to half the code or maybe like 40% of the code was, was stuff that I had contributed. And yeah. And Mustafa and I were, were great friends from that point on for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. So after you met in summer and, so you were working on Ladybug in your spare time. So when did you decide to go on full on with Ladybug? So, well, probably the moment I made the decision when I, was when I first saw Mustafa's video there. <laughs> but I, I honestly, at that point, though, I, I didn't know how to code at all. I mean, and maybe that's why you hear me talking about like things like the trauma of code, because I mean, well, it was seven years ago, but I guess it's was relatively recent like after after i saw that and i started using ladybug and i you know i saw that i could actually edit the code that's when i i really started trying to teach myself yeah and mustafa actually pointed me to that 48 hour youtube series that i binge watched that you know that got me started and it was actually by the end of that summer i had put together my first component but like you know as you can imagine it was built through it was just a few lines of code but built through hours of like of frustration <laughs> of trying to learn how to how to do certain things but yeah but you know i kept at it and over you know over the next year like you know you you really start to get the hang of it uh, mm-hmm. so. yeah uh, if you can name one book which had the biggest impact on your life what would that be and why well, this is well, maybe this is a little bit of a loaded question, so you might get a <laughs> a uh, like a an unexpected answer. Like if I had to say the book that influenced my life the most, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that maybe I might say like when I was five years old, I think the first book that I read cover to cover was this little astronomy book that my parents had gotten me, and like that one definitely changed my life. <laughs> like I mean, uh, it's it obviously was not uh, you know not a very long read. <laughs> We're a five-year-old, but I think that that jumps out a lot of my interest in science. And I even remember like uh, reading reading about like the Big Bang, which had just been proven as a theory in that book, and like and asking my dad like, is this actually how the universe started? And, you know, like yeah, I just I that that was a very influential book for me. But I guess if I were to give like a more serious answer about like what books influenced my career, I mean these are going to be relatively recent ones, maybe just because they're fresh in my mind. But a uh, really good book called uh, Project Drawdown, or or sorry, it was just called Drawdown by Paul Hawken. I read recently. Really like helped me 
wrap my head around like just possible solutions to climate change. That was a great book. Some stuff by uh, Kyle Mo. He's a, he's, a, he's a professor at Harvard, and he he did some very good, at least like good stuff that shapes your philosophy about how to think about thermodynamics. I definitely appreciated his stuff. And what else? I could say these these are all really specific to the things I care about. There, but there's a book on adaptive thermal comfort that definitely helped shape how I added a lot of thermal comfort stuff to Ladybug. But that was by Susan Rofe and Michael Humphreys and. Yeah, it's a, they have a series, but yeah, I don't know. Those are a little bit more career-oriented rather than the book I read when I was five. <laughs> I see. And lastly, in this uh, background section, any mentors or role model who made a significant contribution in your life? Yeah, definitely. Definitely, there are a lot of people I have to thank for sure. I mean, maybe just, well, I probably first and foremost of everyone would be Mustafa, you know, just as the person who really, I mean, if, yeah, if it wasn't for him first releasing Ladybug, uh, and I mean, he was also the first one to start Ladybug, the Ladybug Tools LLC, you know, and, and I joined a few months later too. But if it, yeah, he's been a huge, uh, really positive influence in my life, and I, I can't thank him enough. I mean, there are also, I mean, yeah, there are lots of professors I have to thank. I mean, Les Norford at MIT was a huge, uh, huge help with my thesis, and very supportive also of just of the work that I started to do on Ladybug Tools when I was there. Um, Christoph Reinhardt was also really uh, important at MIT. Andra Manchaco is my coworker at the architecture office that I used to work at and was also at MIT with me. She was really helpful. I guess I already mentioned like Michelle Addington back in college and, and Dean Sakamoto is another architect who I worked for for a year and definitely helped mentor me a lot. Probably like two scientists who were really helpful for getting me back into, just back into science after college was these earth scientists who I published a research paper with who were Ron Smith and Chewy Lee. They're, they're still at Yale doing, doing cool earth science stuff. And then maybe, yeah, in the abstract, if I'm just to say, I mean, those are all people in my life, but like role models throughout history, maybe, maybe I would say like Grace Hopper, who is the woman who invented like the first, what people would call a computer language. Because before that, most people were really just coding in zeros and ones. And because of the trend that she started and, and, you know, the development of that first language, it's, was a lot less traumatic, certainly, to learn how to code <laughs> than it would have been otherwise, working in zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. Now we will move on to our next section, which is about your professional work. So can you share your journey from designer to software developer? What were the critical factors that played a crucial role to start uh, your own firm? Yeah. So it's maybe, yeah, it's a little helpful to actually think of these maybe as two separate questions because there was maybe like a five-year gap between when I started to become a software developer and really heavily contributing to Ladybug and when we and when we started the Ladybug Tools LLC. And I mean, yeah, I, I guess I covered a lot of like that process of what it was like to become a software developer. And, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll also just say though that, that I mean, that feeling of reward when you get, when you finally implement something and you post it on, let's say a forum and someone makes use of it. Like there's, there were a few things in the world that I find more rewarding than that of just, you know, seeing other people being helped and making use of something that I, that you created. So that was a, that, that is a very, was a very important uh, in my journey of becoming a software developer and just in transitioning from a designer as into, into more of a software development role. I mean, as far as the factors that like led us to start our own company, I mean, like I know all the way back when I first met Mustafa, like he was already saying like, you know, in the, in, in the long term, like, you know, the reason why he was trying to build the community around it was to, you know, that one day maybe we can, ha we can have a, a business around it. But it was probably, I mean, it wasn't until I, I guess, well, like two or three years ago when we started to realize that, you know, I mean, we were hitting the limits of all the stuff that we could do with an, with our, you know, typical office job in an architecture office. And, you know, because we, when you develop just for like a, a project by project basis, like you're constantly just adding little fixes and little new features here, and you never really redoing like a ground up revision. And if you don't do that kind of ground up revision after a certain point, like it just, you know, you're building this like massive, you know, uh, weight on top of stilts, basically, and you know it's gonna it's gonna crumble at some point. Uh, so we knew that we really needed to get some justification to work like more full time on it. So we applied to several grants, 
initially, like Mustafa, like as I said, was the first one who just you know quit his his former job and just and started to try to work full time on this. And initially, we were just thinking to maybe if we can get one of these grants, like at least Mustafa will be supported. Uh, but we managed to get all the three that we applied for, including the, the biggest one, which is, uh, was this grant from the Department of Energy. And so that's allowed us, like we're, we're okay for another like year or two at this point, thanks to that, that grant. And we're able to do this full revision of the software and to build certain uh, services now that we can you know, uh, offer off of the software. So while the software is always like free and open source and we're committed to that, we'll start to sell some services around it so that, so that we can support ourselves in the long term. What was your vision behind Ladybug? Were you expecting so massive adoption? This, well, no. <laughs> no. In short, no. I, like Both of the staff and I were surprised when we realized, like, I guess, I, I think it was just one day that Mustafa checked Food for Rhino and he realized that we were the most downloaded plugin for environmental design. And we were like the, the third most downloaded plugin over all of like Grasshopper. And that was, that was like a shock to both him and me. Like we, we didn't, I mean, to be honest, when we first, like, well, I, I know Mustafa says this, and I think it too, when we first started developing the software, like we were mostly just trying to solve our own problems uh, and develop the things that we were interested in. And, you know, and we just gradually kept adding on to that, that software as we would, add, you know, as we were kind of scratching our own itch, if you will. And, you know, because we shared it, because Mustafa, like, made sure to set up the forum and at least, you know, made sure to answer people's questions up there, it just really started blossoming into uh, this this much bigger phenomenon than we ever realized. And I, I don't think we even quite realized that just the field of environmental design had so many people to download the plugins for. <laughs> so I, I think, I mean... It, it it almost makes us feel that maybe like the community was able to grow a little bit because of the the fact that we we offered these tools and and maybe to say that I'm not crazy I like some people have actually told me that they they wouldn't have had their jobs their current jobs without uh, ladybug tools and that definitely warms my heart and it's the reason you know it definitely keeps us motivated it's the reason why we're starting a company and trying to make sure that this stays viable well into the long term so mm -hmm. And can you walk us through the key projects you did in your career? Is it, so do you mean re like related to software development for the most part or like? Uh, like from what, when you graduated to what position you are today, what were some career highlights? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe if we can still count this as part of the, the graduation part, the thesis that I produced, which was, I, it was a combination of both adding code to both the Ladybug tools and doing a design project with that, uh, because this was a dual thesis between building science and architecture. And so I ended up developing these high resolution thermal comfort maps, building off of a lot of other people's work. But as far as I knew, no one, no one had really developed something to as high of both a spatial and temporal resolution as what I had put together for that. Uh, and so, I mean, it was a lot of work to get that together over the course of these. There's a lot of frustration <laughs> with coding, for sure, you know, as I was still learning and not as good at, at software development as I am today. But to see at the end, like, to be able to produce these, you know, run simulations that took, like, you know, a day, but to have these, like, you know, really high-resolution depictions of and understandings of temperature throughout buildings, it was just, that was really rewarding for me, really motivating. And and I guess to say that, you know, that it, it influenced the rest of my career, I still use that that thermal mapping stuff. I used it a lot while I was working in an architecture office. Uh, I And actually one of the grants that we applied to, one of, albeit one of the smaller ones, was actually to totally redevelop this this comfort mapping capability and offer it with the with the new revision of the plugins that we've, we've put together now. So that was definitely a highlight. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of, let's see, a lot of other good highlights of I mean, while I was working in practice, there were just a number number of moments when I realized that, you know, I, I guess the, the thing with working with uh, an engine like, like Energy Plus, which is what we use to model building energy under the hood, I mean, the thing is almost, it's 25 years old, I think, at this point, and it's got this all this accumulated knowledge of, like, experts built up all over this time. Uh, so there were just a lot of moments of realizing that, you know, someone had developed something for this, you know, tw 10 years ago and wrote it into this program. And now we can still make use of it and unearth it. Uh, just like the, yeah, that constant re realization of like, you know, 
someone else has, has done this and done a pretty good job or done most of the work for me, uh, right? And we can just we can just expose it and bring it back into the light and into the community of people using the software. Mm -hmm. And can you walk us through one of your project in detail? It can be a particular component or aspect of either Ladybug. What was your approach, challenges faced in that project and your final output? So I guess the, the main type of thing that I was trying to tackle with my thesis was I noticed that a lot of the practice, the at least while I was, you know, while I had some internships and worked out in practice, was built around this very kind of like narrow way of using energy modeling, where you'd basically you'd pull out the energy use from your model, your heating and cooling and other other types of energy use end uses. Uh, and you'd separately look at thermal comfort and, you know, you just plug all the things from that energy model into a comfort model and it would tell you, are you comfortable? Or are you not comfortable? And this is like the basic way that a lot of strategies were being evaluated in practice with energy modeling that is. And the thing is really the only metric that's used to, uh, you know, evaluate how valuable a certain strategy is, is just this bar of, you know, heating, cooling, et cetera. Uh, right. And that's the whole sort of measuring stick that you have. And as long as you pass the, the thermal comfort, no one actually really looks into it. But this overlooks like a huge alternate way of designing with energy modeling where you can say, like, take all these different aspects, you know, all these different outputs that you can get from an energy model, like the temperatures of surfaces and the air temperature and the humidity of that, that temperature. All of this gets computed by your typical energy model. And you can synthesize it all into this high resolution thermal comfort map, which this and this was really the, the goal of my thesis was to try and enable the production of these comfort maps from energy models and then use the sort of explore the alternate ways that we could design with these comfort maps, right, where, where we could actually then evaluate the value of a strategy, not in terms of like how much heating or cooling it saved, but how much extra comfort it gave to the occupants. And this opened also open doors for like passive design, right? If you don't have an air conditioning or heating system at all, you can still evaluate whether a strategy is a good idea and how good of an idea it is by looking at these high resolution maps as opposed to yeah as opposed to needing to, to put in a fake energy you know HVAC system or something like that um, so this is the basic premise and there are lots of details which maybe I'll gloss over right now <laughs> uh, but just to say that like you know where I developed the, these these capabilities and put them into uh, the software and finally, when I got around to trying to explore the sort of design possibilities with this, I wanted to sort of get away from the kind of typical notion that we think of a lot of our buildings as these kind of sealed climate chambers where, you know, you're tightly controlling all the variables of, of temperature and humidity as best as you can and sort of try and rediscover what I think were probably much more common ways of designing in the past before the advent of heating and cooling systems where you might, let's say, have an occupant really be a participant in the architecture, where they might, let's say, sit in the sun on a cold winter's day or move up to a, a loft, uh, you know, under the covers in the winter night or retreat deep into a building, you know, on a, on a hot summer's day away from the sun or and come back out to the facade at night to experience the cool breezes that I want to try and rediscover this with my thesis. And also just, uh, you know, understand also what's possible with buildings instead of having you, you know, people wake up in a conditioned bubble, jump in a conditioned car, go to a conditioned office, right? Everyone's always in this bubble of air. Like what was possible, especially in terms of communal spaces where you have like these historic places like hearts and sunrooms and saunas, or you have, uh, you know, in, in hot climates, you have collective spaces around uh, cool areas like the earthen temples that you might find carved into mountainsides in India or Islamic gardens with their cool water features. Or even like in the US, if you go to Los Angeles, the swimming pool as like a kind of communal thermal center, right? And sort of what was possible if we weren't organizing all of our spaces like this in these hierarchies around energy systems, but could allow this much more organic, you know, sets up communal spaces and smaller private thermal spaces. So I really wanted to try and see if I could discover some of these methods that were used to design these old spaces using this, these methods of thermal comfort mapping. And so I set out sort of first methodically running many, many variations of a, just a single apartment. And just trying to, without any heating cooling system, just trying to understand what happened to the temperature in the space as I, let's say, you know, shifted the, the section up and down, or I added some shade or made it deeper instead of shorter, 
or added some strategies like connecting to underground or evaporative cooling and stuff like that. This was all, by the way, this one was in a Los Angeles climate in the, in the San Fernando Valley where it gets very hot at a specific, you know, this is the hottest week of the year looking at temperature. And so from this, we could, you know, I pulled out the strategies that I thought were most interesting or most effective and, you know, synthesize those together, you know, where you, we can create these kind of cool microclimates by offsetting the section, alternating those, really accentuating those cooler indoor microclimates that remain thermally stable into the heat of the day, extruding that, and, you know, and then you have basically a typology for an apartment complex, a totally passive apartment complex in Los Angeles in this case. And the nice thing about having these maps and having developed it with these maps is that we could actually go back and take a design like this and run an entire energy model with it and verify that it was actually working the way that you'd expect. And sure enough, you see this is in the hottest part of the day around like 4 p.m. in this climate in the hottest week of the year. And these living spaces in the center of these apartments are still nice and cool, even though the bedrooms and these auxiliary spaces are still, still quite hot. And you can see you can still create communal spaces by connecting to the earth and stuff like that. And I think, <laughs> yeah, this is just an animation over the course of that day showing like how at night in the bedrooms, everything's nice and cool and people can remain in there, but then the sun starts to stream in. Uh, and by the time you start getting to the afternoon, those you know perimeter spaces are very hot, but the people can hang out in these cooler indoor spaces or in the, or in the kind of basement uh, communal area and be able to still remain nice and comfortable until finally the sun sets and things start to cool down again and then they can go back out to their bedrooms. So this was something that, you know, just trying to rediscover what may have been like a pattern of usage in passive buildings that we might have lost by making everything, uh, you know, heated and cooled. And this is just an a exterior shot showing that those balconies actually kind of remain a little bit warm and release their heat slower to the sky at night, making them a nicer place to hang out after sunset. Like quite interesting work. And I was wishing like I can just, you can just go on and on because I was absorbing lots of amazing information. Yeah. yeah. And I think one follow-up question to your work is, did you use like already traditional conventional software for analysis or were you developing your own tools? So, yeah, it, it depends on what you mean by traditional because, well, I think the important thing to realize, especially with any sort of computer modeling, is that you're you're always building off of or, you know, or any sort of science work, you're building off of other people's efforts. Even if it's just the, you know, borrowing the, the first law of thermodynamics to write a new piece of computer software. But I mean, the vast majority, so the thing that produced those thermal maps and actually computed all those temperatures under the hood was an engine called Energy Plus that you heard me mention that the Department of Energy is supporting has been around for like 25 years. Um, and so, so that part we did not need to redevelop. Like I didn't need to make any software that, you know, could model the temp the surface temperatures of indoor buildings or the air temperatures. What I did develop though was all the stuff to try and take that those raw numbers of just you know surface temperatures and air temperatures that Energy Plus spits out and turn them into something visual and spatial. And also, I guess the other thing in that process was that I plugged them into a thermal comfort model to try and assess whether people would feel hot or cold. So that part I had to develop. I had to develop all the visualization, and I had to develop the stuff that kind of synthesized all of that those separate pieces of results into like the visuals that you saw there but yeah but I mean the good thing is though that everything down from the very top to the very bottom everything is open source including energy plus and so that made it a lot easier to develop on top of it and to change things if I needed to mm -hmm. yeah I think that definitely encourages more people to build co code upon that yeah, 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 definitely build on other people's work or at least research other people's work before you try and build something yourself. That's a that would be my advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And according to you, what are the roadblocks faced by AEC industry to adopt new technologies? So yeah, I mean there are there are a lot of them, I would say, but probably I mean, if I'm to, to talk specifically about one that I know affects architecture and buildings, uh, the building industry in general. It's just that like more so than I think a lot of other industries, the building industry, it's, it's, it's I guess, conservative or, or kind of, it has a lot of inertia. It's like, it's not uh, very 
you know, not as open to change, I think, as some of the other industries. And I mean, there are good reasons for that because largely because we expect our buildings to last a very long time, right? You don't want to, like, if you make a mistake in, you know, in the process, there are consequences drawn out throughout a very long period of time. And so I think for that reason, there's this inclination throughout the building industry to just keep doing what we always did because we knew it worked. We don't want to change it. Like, you know, and that can kind of kill a lot of the innovation potentially, you know, if you let that drive your whole process. But I mean, if I were to give like one piece of advice, especially like something that we have now with computer simulation, is that like it used to be like if you wanted to test if an idea worked, you had to build the whole building you had to live in it for a little bit and you had to see like, did my idea actually work out in practice? And the really amazing thing about computer simulation is that you don't have to build a building every time you want to test if something, if a new idea that you have is going to work. Right. And it's, it's almost like a time machine that you have that lets you cross cut what would have taken, you know, centuries of trial and error to, to arrive at a certain design that you can go through that process in just a few months and arrive at, yeah, ar arrive at something much, much better uh, than you could uh, otherwise. So, yeah, so simulation is definitely a really important tool, I think, in breaking down this, uh, you know, inherent conservative nature that I think the building industry has and the resistance to change that it has, because you can really prove and show that something will work before you build it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what are some software tools which you think would be used quite common five years from now, but are not used today? Hmm, that's a good, okay, that's a good point. Let's see, well, yeah, because I can definitely say stuff like Energy Plus has been around 25 years, it's gonna be here in five years from now. Yeah, as far as the new things that would be coming, I, the first thing that jumped to mind is stuff that I know we're developing and we're close to being able to release, which are not being used right now, but I, I'm sure that they will be once we have them out. I mean. The, the complete revision of the software that we did for our stuff has allowed us to make plugins for Revit and a range of other CAD interfaces and web interfaces. So I would, I would bet that those are going to be used five years from now and they, they aren't being used be, right now because they're still under development. But if I were to talk more specifically, let's see. Yeah, it, it's, it's tough because it, you know, trying to answer that question is like trying to say what problem is the biggest right now that we'll see software try to come in and, and try and ameliorate or help with. I mean, I definitely think that there's, there's probably going to be more software that's geared to, rather than being geared specifically to architects and engineers, there's probably software that's going to be more geared, I think, towards owners or developers or some of the other stakeholders involved in the process of, of creating buildings. I mean, I, I just, I know of a lot of startups actually right now that are really trying to gear themselves towards being more amenable to people who may not have a design background or may, you know, or, or may not, you know, have invested time to learn CAD software, but they still want to just mock up something to show. So I think, I think software in that realm is probably going to become much more commonplace. And I think maybe specifically say with Ladybug tools, like we're trying to do a lot, especially now that we have the core of our software divorced from any particular CAD environment, that we're trying to make it at least very easy for those experts running the simulations to share, not just like a single visual with the, with, you know, their clients and the, the other stakeholders in the building process, but just actually share whole interfaces and dashboards so that, you know, that those owners and other stakeholders can actually look through the data and under and make their own conclusions and you know and actually appreciate the vast amount of work that went into some of these simulations so yeah i think yeah if i had to say a general category of software that i think is going to be more commonplace it's probably stuff that's going to engage clients and owners and other stakeholders mm -hmm. and i would like to know your thoughts on how like artificial intelligence and machine learning might shape the design process in building industry yeah yeah that's that's a good question and i mean so the thing is yeah there's also do you know the the concept of the technology hype cycle i because i think it's very useful for maybe explaining like where where we are with artificial intelligence right now so i mean it, it was the hype cycle is an idea that was coined by i forget it there was some journalist but he was saying, noticing that like every new technology that would come out, like, you know, Apple releases the iPad 
And, you know, at first there's like this huge hype about it. Everyone's so excited. It's like, it's going to solve all of our problems. It's going to be great. And then, you know, people actually buy it and they get it and they start using it and they realize, oh, well, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really solve all the problems I thought it was going to solve. Like, you know, okay, all right. It solves all these limitations and these other things. And, you know, there's what they call the trough of disillusionment where like, you know, people realize that it's not as good as the hype showed it to be. But, you know, over time, like that trough, you know, I mean, some software dies in the trough of disillusionment and some, some technology dies there. But others, like, you know, people keep using it and they keep, you know, realizing, okay, it's still good for some things. And eventually they reach what they call the plateau of productivity where, you know, people are, are you know, it's not as good as the hype cycle, but not at the trough of disillusionment. It's, you know, they're making good use of this, the technology. And, you know, that tends to be stable throughout time. So I think, I think that we're still in like a process. Like I witnessed like hype cycles in AEC with like optimization. Like there's a lot of excitement about optimization at first. And then, you know, you build your first Galapagos model and you realize like I ran, you know, it took three hours to solve a problem, you know, design question that I probably could have answered in a few minutes by building a simpler model. But, you know, over time I realized optimization or, you know, genetic algorithms are good for maybe just these small set of things that I apply them on right now. But yeah, I think eight, like artificial intelligence is going through the same thing. I think we're still kind of at the peak of the, the hype cycle and we haven't, we got a long ways to go till we realize all the useful ways that we want to apply it. And I think especially, I see, I mean, I see a lot of people right now trying to use artificial intelligence to increase speed. And I, I, don't know, I mean, there may be some applications in that that end up proving useful, but I, I feel like the main, probably the real, the biggest benefit that AI can really give is, isn't necessarily increasing like speed of simulations or trying to necessarily, you know, really predict, like, let's say, so that you don't have to run a whole energy model to estimate your energy use. I mean, I, because I, it's still, it's very, much more valuable to know that the numbers you got were derived from physics and to be able to know those with solidity than just have, I mean, if you need something quick, you can do a simplified version of those numbers, maybe is what I would say. Rather, I think probably the real areas where like artificial intelligence could be a really big help is like, you know, is the excellent applications we see of it now. Like, you know, Amazon suggesting like customers who bought this one also bought that one, right? There probably are ways that that could be integrated into some types of software. I think where, you know, you, you say like, you ran a building like this before, here are five other buildings that, you know, were kind of like that. Maybe you want to use them to, look at them in order to set your assumptions for the current model that you're building or something like that. Like those types of applications or, you know, in search queries, like the way Google uses it, those are obviously amazing applications of it. So I think if we could find ways maybe to gear ourselves more towards those applications, maybe rather than just purely using them to increase the speed of stuff that we already do, that seems, it's, I feel like we'll get to that plateau of productivity a little faster. Mm -hmm. What are some emerging trends in the field of computational design? Yeah, so so yeah, you have this stuff at the start of the hype cycle. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, I guess I, maybe I already uh, mentioned one was just like the sharing of, of computational design and the, those results that people produce from computationally designed things with a wider audience, including like building owners and, and other stakeholders. That's definitely a trend that I see is on the rise right now. Yeah, I mean, as far as other sort of, general trends i mean yeah i mean if well let's see i i can certainly say like in terms of like software well the tr the trend that we're following and the trend that i see a, like almost all software projects follow like what we're undergoing now with ladybug tools of like totally revising the software and like making it you know like almost 90 percent of the code is independent of like any particular operating system or CAD environment, like this process of like pulling out the core and making it its own like, you, you know, thing. This is what I see happening all over the place. I mean, I, I know like McNeil just finished this with Rhino that they pulled out a lot of their core so that they can offer like Rhino inside. I, I guess, and actually a lot of this maybe, maybe this, a lot of that is a precursor to more software as a service, right? That people want to try and take the, you know, well, it was traditionally just a desktop application, put it on a, on a cloud service uh, and, you know, and offer access to it or access to certain capabilities to it through, through that. So that's probably, yeah, that's, yeah, that's definitely an increasing trend these days of, of things moving towards software as a service and moving, you know, trying to divorce, I guess, the things that run all the simulations or do all the hard work 
um, put that on a server as opposed to having everyone's computer needing that, needing those capabilities. Mm -hmm. And my last question in your professional work section is, is there anything you wished uh, you would have d done differently in your career? Hmm. That is, that is a good question. I mean, it, and it's always hard to answer because, right, the decisions you made led you to where you are here, and I'm, I'm very happy where I am right now. But yeah, if I were to say something different, I mean, I guess, I guess when when I was in college, and I mean, when, I guess when I first got involved in in architecture, as I explained, I felt like I kind of left behind a lot of the the sciences that I were was interested in then, and I, I mean, I understood why I did it at the time, but I think if I had maybe kept it a little like closer to me. I might have actually probably done a dual degree in architecture and some sort of environmental science while I was in, still in college. But yeah, I think yeah, I kind of I yeah I and maybe part of that was also like me taking that first semester of college taking like a physics course that really burned me out. <laughs> but yeah, but I think yeah, if there's one thing I could have changed, maybe I would have stayed more involved in 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 sciences throughout college as opposed to trying to pick it all back up in grad school kind of. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what is the best advice you have received till date? Hmm. That's that's a that's a loaded question, but let's see. Let's see. I can give some like at least point point people to some good areas. This is probably like so maybe I should say like the closest thing to like a religious text in the area of software development is is this little poem that's called the Zen of Python which is just filled with like knowledge and advice that you know you can tell like a lot of software developers put into into these like short you know I mean it's only like I think 20 or 20 line poem but that has proved like you know over the last few years like I keep realizing like oh my gosh that's what they meant by this that's what this means like you know all sorts of great advice in that thing <laughs> for sure so the zen of python i would definitely recognize recommend as as full of good advice when you mention about zen of python is it about like how the software developer should think or work it's yeah it's very philosophical yeah i mean and and maybe just to say like each line is you know it's is a, like a piece of advice or like a i mean the first line is like explicit is better than it, it, than implicit, which, you know, may, I mean, when I, when you first read it, it doesn't necessarily have much meaning, but like when you start to develop software and you realize like all the areas where like, oh, I wish I, I should have just been more explicit about this uh, because all these people misinterpreted my code or my software. Like it just, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's very useful in that respect. <laughs> gotcha. And what will be your advice to students and young professionals who are interested to do similar work? Hmm. So, yeah, so I, I, I think I mentioned earlier, and I guess I'll say it again, that if, if you are interested in developing software, trying to get those, those three things that I mentioned, just making sure you have a reference that you can always go back to, to, to understand the fundamentals of coding or whatever you're working on, making sure that you are applying it, you know, to some projects that you have some projects that you really want to, and, and goals that you want to tackle. And then just making sure you have a community to ask your questions to. Like, yeah, as long as you have those three things and, and you don't give up, <laughs> right? I mean, and as I said, like, it's, uh, it's very easy to get frustrated at some points in, 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 in the process. But as long as you don't give up, you keep those three things there to help you, you'll, you'll get through. Yeah. And as far as, I mean, if I, maybe if I can give some advice to people who want to, I guess, straddle the line between architecture and building science or architecture and environmental design, I mean, I... I guess yeah, I would definitely say that just remind people like I, at first, like I, I thought these were naturally, you know, when I first took that course back in the first semester of college, I thought they fit hand in hand and that everybody had just acknowledged that these two disciplines are always meant to talk to each other. But I realized over time that that was not, not really the case and that it was a relatively new phenomenon that people have tried to like wed these two topics and areas of knowledge. So my advice would be like, if you are engaging in this area of, of trying to straddle the line between architecture and environmental science or environmental design or building science, just, yeah, just don't be afraid. Like you are on the right side of history. <laughs> these, these two topics are only becoming more intertwined. And if people tell you that the thing that you're doing is not architecture, 
or if a scientist tells you that what you're doing is not science, like, you know, just, you know, you're, you're on the right path. It's, we need more people that are welding these two things together. And uh, yeah. And if anyone tries to, to convince you otherwise, then, then they're, they're not on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned briefly about many times when people use Galapagos, it takes a lot of time. And personally, when I was running building simulation, it took decent amount of time. And when you pair that up with Galapagos, then it takes mm -hmm. a good amount of time. So what will be your piece of advice for, for people who are trying out different iterations with this kind of simulation tools to, to make best use of that time? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So maybe I can just briefly describe the hype cycle that I went through with, with optimization. And I think Mustafa kind of went through as well, which is, I mean, at, at first, like we were all very excited about the, the prospect of optimization. Like, you know, I, I remember, I think I built my first Galapagos model. It was just looking at the optimal depth of an overhang for a simple single zone energy model. And I remember like I ran through, you know, started the Galapagos simulation. It took like two hours to run. And then the optimal result was this overhang that was like five meters deep. <laughs> and I just like, oh, wow, that's, that's, <laughs> that's really not what I was uh, uh, hoping to get out of this. And uh, yeah, and I mean, the reality is, is that like, I guess what I learned over time is that that one optimal solution isn't necessarily the, the most useful thing for the design process because obviously, I mean, even if that five meter overhang was the best thing for the energy use of the building, it's obviously not, it wasn't something that the, you know, was going to get built on this project. So like a much better way to try and tackle this type of prob problem, like we kind of realized over time was by, I guess, instead of trying to find the one optimal solution, like let's just run a range of different options and see what the trade-offs are. Let's see how bad it is if we make it this short versus that short. And I guess the kind of, if there's a term for this, like, you know, this kind of visualization of like all the options, I, I call it design space visualization, like as opposed to just optimization. Other people call it brute force because you're kind of like just running through everything, you know, instead of just trying to find that one optimal solution. But just running those types of studies ended up being much more useful for design because I could say like, all right, if we make them the overhang one meter deep, we still get like 90% of the, the energy benefit, uh, right? And so, you know, I didn't need to go to a client and explain to them that they should make a five meter deep overhang and stuff like that, right? They're like, invariably, the world is going to be more complex than the optimization simulations we can set up. And so recognizing that in the way that you put together your simulations can really help pay off and just help you make better decisions in the long run. Mm -hmm. And what are some tools or software or applications you would recommend to people who want to learn and grow in this area? Some tools, well, ladybug tools. <laughs> <laughs> not, not biased there for sure. Yeah, I mean, let, let's see. I can say like, maybe we'll start first. If you're looking to try and develop software, like what computer language I, I'd recommend. I mean, obviously I'm biased here because all of our work is in Python. But if I can say like, it was definitely much easier for me to learn how to code because I was learning Python as opposed to some of the other, what they call lower level languages. Lower le I mean, to give an example of like the lower level languages, those would be things like uh, C or C++ or C Sharp probably anything with a C in it, <laughs> that that's, uh, it's, takes a little bit more time to pick up. I mean, granted, there are much finer levels of detail you can control with those languages than, than just Python. But I mean, all you can see all of Ladybug was pretty much developed in Python. So yeah, I mean, you could like 90% of the stuff that you would probably need to do for at least environmental design or 99% can all be done with Python. So I'd really recommend that. It'll, it'll, definitely speed up the process of, of learning, I think, to start from there as opposed to with the lower level language. Let's see. As far as other tools, I mean, well, I probably, I'm probably preaching to the choir by saying just learning Grasshopper. Actually, probably Grasshopper is even a good precursor to learning computer languages uh, because a lot of the same principles that you use in Grasshopper, it's, it's interesting. You could probably draw like a whole educational pathway from just like Excel and just like the pure maths in there to Grasshopper and realizing that anything you can do in Excel, you can do in Grasshopper with visual scripting. And then to like, you know, coding in a real language like Python that, yeah, there's like a, you know, continuous set of, they build off of one another. So learning Grasshopper is not just a good way to 
learn how to inform your own design and build parametric geometry models, but also learn a lot of the same principles that are inherent in computer software and programming languages. Yeah, as far as other tools, I mean, maybe I'll also give a shout. Probably the two, like the two big languages I'd re recommend would be Python. JavaScript is also pretty good. If you're really interested in web development, you have to, you have to learn JavaScript pretty much. It's the, it's the language of the web. And it's, and it's similar to Python. It's a higher level language. And so you can pick up a lot of it much more quickly. Yeah, I think, I think that covers a lot of the tools and applications that I'd really recommend people, at least people who want to go into the area that, uh, that, that I'm in right now. Maybe, maybe one other thing just to say if with, with regards to learning programming languages is that you usually find like most of the value of computer languages is, are actually, it's not necessarily in the language itself, but in all these other, the ecosystem of other packages and bits of software that people have made or, or rather what people call SDKs or, or I guess in Python we call them packages or, or APIs some people call them, but make sure like do your research uh, to see if someone else has put together a package or an SDK or API for something if you, if you want to learn that and build off their work. Yeah. And personally, I have faced that few of the components in Ladybug Honeybee requires a background knowledge on like what are the different parameters and how it affects the building in a way. So is there any book or a guideline we, uh, one can refer to, to make the best use of those parameters and know how to play with it? Yeah, yeah. So, well, if I could say, yeah, we've, we've tried to set up Ladybug tools uh, such that at least the resources, the same resources that I said are that you need to learn how to code are available for Ladybug tools. So there's like, there's a lot of reference material. There's like, you know, at least 10 hours of YouTube videos that are free. Admittedly, they're done with a pretty old version of the software. Hopefully we'll, we'll remake some new ones when we have the, the new release of the software. But actually, and, and on our platform, if you become a patron, there's a small like uh, advertisement, but we have about like 40 hours of videos, most of which are recordings of the workshops we teach available to our, our patrons who support us with just $25 a month. So that that's a good, we give you the reference material. There's obviously also a lot of reference material just in the descriptions of the components themselves and stuff so that you can always check that. I mean, the projects, well... I mean, it's kind of up to you to, as, a, as a person learning the software to have projects or things that you want to apply them to. We do have a, an example file sharing platform called Hydra that has a bunch of, of scripts that, Grasshopper scripts that are already set up to run specific types of studies. And so those can probably be a good starting point for trying to apply something to a project. Because chances are probably as you, well, as you're applying to a project, you're going to at least change something with those Grasshopper definitions. And at the very least, you change the geometry to be your own project's geometry. But yeah, but just playing with those actually can probably give you a good sense of how to get started. And then, of course, there's our forum, uh, discourse.ladybug.tools, that has, it gets like 4,000 page views per day. And that's, that's a, your main portal to the community for, for learning the software. Mm -hmm. How can our listeners follow you and your work? So probably, I mean... I, I tend to be not quite as active personally on social media. I tend to do like a lot more stuff through through Ladybug Tools platforms. So probably, I mean, if you, if well, and part of this is just because like a huge fraction of my like of the things that people reach out to me for are questions about the software. <laughs> so uh, yeah, especially if you have anything software related, please do it through the discourse through that that forum discourse.ladybugtools. That's the best place to do it because also if I'm not able to answer the questions, then there are tons of other people in the community who could help you. I mean, yeah, if, if you like, you can follow, like most of the tweets I do are just retweets of, of stuff we post from Ladybug, the Ladybug Tools Twitter. So I'd recommend probably just following the Ladybug Tools Twitter if you, yeah, if you want to stay updated on the, the things that we're doing with the software. So yeah, that's, those would be the main things. If you, if, yeah, probably the best thing, if you need to reach me personally, the forum is the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think lastly, I would really like to thank you for your time and sharing those kind, this amazing stories. It's quite inspiring to me personally. And like, I believe it will inspire a lot of people as well. So. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you, Mayur. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have a nice rest of your Friday and weekend.
Okay, you too, Mayur. Thanks, yeah. thanks again for everything. Yeah. Bye, Chris. Okay. Have a good one. Yep.